Welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. Cactus and edgy succulents have joined our horizon as favorites in the garden and in containers. The only downside for some gardeners is that edgy factor. Today, Cindy Arredondo from Desert to Tropics gets us in touch with child and garden friendly specimens and how to grow them. On tour, let's visit a makeover that started with a passion for these plants. When Carol and Richard Blocker go out front, it isn't to see whether it's time to mow. It was a chance event in San Antonio that catapulted them into serious collection and design with cactus and succulent plants. I grew up in South Florida and my dad always had cactus and plants growing in the yard down there because it doesn't freeze. And I moved to Texas, I lived in Houston and we had a lot of tropical plants and we bought a few cactus at a nursery one time and made a dish garden and uh, we fell in love with them. And we moved to San Antonio and they were having a cactus show and sale and we walked in the mall and we didn't even know there was a cactus club and there was vendors selling plants up and down the mall and there was just thousands of different plants and then we found out that there, were, there was a club and we joined the club and that was 32 years ago and we've been growing them ever since. When they bought their house, Carol and Richard knew just how they wanted to replace the front yard's languishing trees and dead grass. To start, they shaped gravel-based mounds topped with a gritty soil mix. I put a limestone base down first and mount, mounded that up and then just put my, my cactus mix that I made, sandy, gravelly mix on top of that. Everybody always thinks that they need to dig out and refill in and it's so much easier just to build up where you can have some contour and some slopes to it for drainage and you can just build up on top of your normal native soil that we have here. The neighbors weren't sure what was going on at first when I started cutting down the trees and uh, I told them that I'm going to plant cactus and it was years before I actually got the whole front yard to where it looked semi-finished but it's an ongoing ever-changing garden. After years of drought, the neighbors are considering a new look too. From the blockers, they've learned that a well-designed cactus and succulent garden is like any other. It's about contrast in colors, size, and texture, responding to individual needs, and grouping suitable combinations to intrigue the eye. There's such a variety of cactus and succulents. It's one of the biggest families of plants in the world. And just their shapes and the textures and how they grow. And they're just so unique and different. Their flowers aren't long lasting, but like other fleeting garden jewels, their brevity heightens the appreciation. The cactus flowers are one of the most beautiful there are in the world to me. They savor their miniature gardens on the backyard patio. Carol and Richard also have an eye for garden art scavenges. It's in fact that they pair cold tender plants with cold hardy ones. In winter, Richard rolls down the sides of his cabana and adds plastic to the ends. Especially tender specimens go into the greenhouse. 
Oddly enough, it's too much summer sun that can hurt some plants, especially small new divisions. Everybody thinks that all cactus are going to take full sun all the time, and that's not true. If you walk out in the desert, um, a lot of times you're going to find smaller cactus growing next to a bigger cactus or to another bush, or a lot of them even grow under bushes where they don't even get full sun. And so you, you want to make little microclimates where one plant's shading another plant, or you can grow, grow a plant next to a rock where it gets shade part of the day. You could tell that they actually will sunburn just like people. If, and they'll, their skin will start turning a little yellow instead of just bright green. And small plants do need some water in times of drought, though not much. Since many of their plants are prolific, they started passing them along. I love the plants and I just got to where I thought this is, this is a neat thing to share with other people. And that's another neat thing about it. You can, you can always add some, remove some, change the look. And that's the fun of doing a cactus garden. It's not something that you plant a bush and you have to just leave it this way for, a, for the entire life of the garden. What a spectacular garden. I love cacti and succulents, and that is just over-the-top beautiful. And Richard Blocker is going to be coming to Austin for the Austin Cactus and Succulent Society show, and he is going to be sitting right next to our next guest at that show. And our next guest is Cindy Arredondo from Desert to Tropics. Yes. It's great to have you back to Central Texas Gardener. It is great to be here with you, Tom. Well, it's always fun visiting about these plants. They're so cool. and. We're putting a different spin on the, the succulents we're going to be talking about today, and, and that is that these are kid-friendly succulents. Exactly. And then why, why kid-friendly? I know that often parents are afraid of, of when you th think of succulents, you often think of needles. Right. right. Cactus yeah. and succulents are synonymous, so people obviously protect their kids, and they don't mm -hmm. want them going anywhere near anything that can hurt them. Right. But these are fabulous varieties that will... Uh, encourage them to not only touch them and feel them, but to plant them and grow them, and, right. and you couldn't ask for more. Well, and uh, before we move on and start talking about the individual plants, I do want to let people know that uh, all these plants, or many of these plants, will be available at the, the show and sale coming up, and uh, y you're going to be there, Richard's going to be there. Um, Do let's Dr. talk Barth. a moment about that, because this, to me, this is one of the most fun shows in Austin. It is. The, the, the fall show and sale is really spectacular because you've got the center tables filled with show plants and you've got raffles and drawings and then you've got vendors from all over the country, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. New Mexico, around Texas, coming together, Arizona, other, Arizona yeah. coming together with really amazing cacti and succulents for sale. So if you want uh, the ultimate selection, mm -hmm. this is the place to be, Labor yeah. Day weekend. It's like aliens have come to visit Austin. It's when you walk <laughs> in the room, some of the plants are so bizarre looking. As Eric as they are, they look like they belong under the water. And they're right. also pottery artisans there as well, right. so homegrown pottery. Right. Well, I know people will really enjoy that, enjoy talking with you. and. And again, our subject are the kid-friendly varieties. And we're going to start off by taking a look at a, a flat of different uh, plants. What, what is the, the species that we're looking at here? Well, speaking of alien, those are lithops. And there's yeah. multiple species in there. Those are native to South Africa. Uh -huh. And um, kids love them. They grow low to the ground. And actually, in South Africa, you would seldom see the top of the plant. Mm -hmm. So inside the little lines and, and grooves are actually solar panels, you could say. Mm -hmm. So when a child holds it up to the sunshine, they can see the light ref reflecting inside the plant. Oh, cool. So it, it's great for the eye, and then all the different ridges and valleys um, mm -hmm. are great to touch and feel, and so kids really love those, and they're super low maintenance, mm -hmm. so. And they're just fun to look at. And you say alien, and, and I, I mean, really, th these do look like they come from another planet, but uh, really uh, fun forms. And I think that's one of the things that kids respond to here. 
often when I go to the nurseries now, I often see kids just staring at the succulent tables mm -hmm. because of all the different forms. It's like eye candy. It really is, and, and those in particular do not want to be watered. Mm -hmm. They want they can be grouped together so you can have different colors, um, different sized ones, and um, put them all together. They flower yellow or white flowers, okay. which will really cover the entire top of the plant. And then come about December or so, the seed pod will be an elephant gray diamond shape right there in the center, and it opens up like a convertible whenever it gets wet. So those are winter growers that you spritz them with a spritzer, you don't want to get the roots wet, and the, the seed pod will open up, allow some seeds to get washed out, and then close back up slowly. So kids really get a kick out of watching well, that's, that's very, nature very in motion. Cool. Well, I talked about forms, and just next to me we have a, a kind of a, a, a nice assortment of different kinds of forms of, of plants here. And I'm just going to pull them some out and I'll let you tell me about them. And, and this one is, is super cool. I love the crenellation in the leaves. And also, the, it's kind of tomatose. It's got all those little hairs on it. It's a soft, fur-like kind of surface to it. It's velvety smooth, native mm -hmm. to Madagascar. That is Calancho barensis, and uh -huh. it will get tree-like. It does great indoors in a bright situation or outdoors in the shade. Kids love them again. The leaves are really ruffly, mm -hmm. and uh, the texture is velvety, so mm -hmm. perfect, perfect for kids. Calancho. It's a uh, calancho. Right. Well, and we're going to see <laughs> some other calanchos in a little bit that uh, really have that same kind of velveteen quality, if you will. That's exactly. a great way to describe it. Um, but you said tree-like. It will be. It grows upright. It branches. And uh -huh. so almost a, a mini tree, mini bush. Uh -huh. um, some people have told me that they grow them in their home in a bright living room. Yeah. And they're just amazed at how well it does and, uh -huh. and sturdy it is. Now, as I'm pulling out some of these plants, <laughs> I want you to tell me what, what your favorite potting mix is. You know, I look at these and what I would do if I was taking it home is get some regular potting soil and cut that like 50% with some kind of mineral sand or something like that. Excuse me, exactly. What my husband Jay has done over the last several mm -hmm. years, I call it the Colonel Secret Recipe. He's got a blend that's just phenomenal, but he takes a base of uh, rose mix out mm -hmm. of the natural gardener okay. and then he will actually cut that with crushed granite or coarse sand mm -hmm. and then add hadite which is expanded shale Okay. and when he makes the mix it'll be basically maybe a third, a third, a third and then he grabs a handful lets it go and if it crumbles just ever so slightly on the edge it's ready to go it's good but if it holds together add a little something to to loosen a it up more granite or and something if it like falls that. away too much add a little more rose soil okay okay well this is another this is another one w which has kind of if you look up closely it has again that kind of hairy little quality not quite as velvety as the other but all it's heading that direction it is, and, and that is a Sempervivum raspberry. Sempervivum means um, ever living. Mm -hmm. And so that is one also known as a hen and chicks. And mm -hmm. as it grows, it will um, fill into the pot. It'll spread over the edges. So you can grow it as a basket. You can grow it as a container specimen. They're native to Europe and very touch friendly. What's great about that is in the spring and in the fall when we have our warm days and our cool nights, mm -hmm. it pops out this beautiful magenta pink color along the edges, ah. which now with the heat of summer, it's turned green and it's just, right. it's enjoying itself. But very vivid and, and cool to the eye for children. Yeah, and a lot of succulents respond to cool weather by taking on pretty colors, which is something they, that people don't often think of. No, they, they, they look great in stress. I wish I had the, the same problem they do. Yeah. Well, this one has a little bit of var variation in the color on the, on the foliage. And this is a little jade plant, it, Crassula? It, it, it is a Crassula ovata. It's a jade. It's the Crosby variety. Okay. So it's known as a Crosby jade. And yes, it gets that beautiful red, red ridge around the mm -hmm. edge. And um, great indoor plant. Kids love them, again, because of the color. Right. Um, parents love them because you don't have to water them. You can have living art inside with these yeah. with these plants. Well, uh, this this is really beautiful. I, I've always loved the jade plants, and you know, you get th when you get these really little fine leaves, though. I mean, there's something about that that is just very appealing, and I, I can see why children find it so appealing and childlike in scale and and, 
uh, eye appeal, I guess. It is. It's gentle and it's sturdy. I mean, you see the, the delicate leaves that are actually sturdier than they look, and uh, then the stems are just husky little guys yeah. in there just holding well, everything together. Yeah, especially. I'm going to show the stems there. Yeah, they're, they're very cool. Now, I have always loved these, and I always forget the name. It it's almost aloe looking, but it's or it's like a cross between an aloe and a sansevera. <laughs> exactly. If you feel the yeah. leaves, it's yeah. thin in some that feels like that sansevera. It's a gasteria hybrid uh -huh. and clusters freely. A mm -hmm. slower grower than average, but a great window plant. So if yeah. a child wants to have his own, a few plants in his room that uh, don't require high light, right. gasterias, haworthias, and and plants like this would mm -hmm. be perfect for them. Yeah, I, I just think this is the coolest looking thing and, and you know there's so many different variants on, on the forms on this particular plant that I've seen over the years so I just really love that one. And even a light little different texture on each of them. Some are smooth, some right. are a little more rigidy and so uh -huh. again it offers that texture that right. I mean kids love to touch things with their fingers Right. and uh, uh -huh. these are plants that welcome it. And kids like to play jokes on people too. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of which, I'm holding a plant that some people call carrion flower um, because the scent of the, the bloom is not particularly pleasant. It is the kiss of death. Uh, it is a beautiful flower from afar, for sure. And the hairs on it. A little scary it, up close. A little scary up close. <laughs> Flies adore it. But if, yeah, if, if your kids are anything like my kids, they love to play tricks. And so whenever these are in bloom, guests will come over and they'll be, oh, what a beautiful flower. And my son, mm. Jared, will say, oh, smell it. Mm -hmm. And they will go and smell it and make some of the best faces <laughs> of, of just being repulsed. Mm -hmm. But a beautiful flower and really easy to care for, um, great for flight control even. So yeah. um, I've got horses, put them out by the barn. The flies go to those to pollinate them and uh, they stay away from other places. Well, so. there you go. Multitasking. Uh, multitasking and an interesting form for the plant when it's not in bloom as well. It's a very attractive and, and again, child friendly, no spines. No spines. It may look like it from afar, but mm -hmm. as you get up close, it's smooth. And some of the variations of the stapelias, which are also native to South Africa, um, do have a light little hair to them. So you get yeah. good texture again. All right. Now, I'm going to skip around a little bit because we, we're running out of time and we have so many cool things to talk about. But you, a little while ago, we mentioned colanchos with the velveteen quality and we have three actually four uh, different varieties right here um, tell me a little bit about these because i just love the variation almost look like animal ears or something <laughs> they do and this one is known as panda ears uh -huh. so um, definitely colancho tomentosa and mm -hmm. this is another variety of tomentosa Over here, yeah. known and as it, the chocolate soldier and it's and i can see why they call it chocolate because it's got that really warm quality to it it is and with more sunlight it gets a little bit bronzer mm -hmm. and uh, or more bronze and so it looks spectacular the the light hits the the velvety leaves mm -hmm. and so you get different a, a different look from every angle and again kids love to touch them really easy mm -hmm. for them to grow they do well inside or out and if a leaf falls off, which is always inevitable, yeah. these guys will put out roots directly from their leaves, mm -hmm. and a child can easily, you know, settle that into the soil, and out pops a new plant. And so see, that's delightful for a young child. It's a science experiment you can do at home uh -huh. and, and really get a kick out of okay, and now, propagate. Now we j we only can have a few seconds to talk about this, but I, I this just think is my it's favorite. so. You, it's your favorite. I'm glad I pulled it out, uh, and it's. It has an appropriate name. It is Cub's Paw. It's, uh. it's a cotyledon, and it looks like a little bear just just <laughs> fighting his way to the sunshine. And children love bears, and they love furry plants. Okay. And so this little furry guy is definitely perfect. Well, I can see the name being perfectly appropriate. And again, you're going to be at the Cactus and <laughs> Succulent Society show on uh, September 4th, 5th, and 6th. Definitely. We will be there with bells on and, and encourage everyone to come out and enjoy the show. And... Uh, Browse and turn your gigabytes into mega giggles, and, uh, <laughs> okay. or turn your megabytes into mega giggles. Great. Well, Cindy Aridano again from Desert to Tropics. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Tom. All right. Coming up next, it's Daphne. Hello, and welcome to Down to Earth. Our question this week is a on a photo sent in by a viewer, and it's really interesting to see. It's not something you may see very often, but it is a really cool natural occurrence. This tomato hornworm has little white things all over it, and the viewer is wondering what those are. 
This is actually uh, from a parasitic wasp. The adult of this wasp lays eggs on the back of the caterpillar. These, egg, these eggs hatch and then have nice little caterpillar for dinner. Then they pupate and these white things all over the caterpillar are actually the cocoons. You can actually see some holes in the end of those white tubes, and that is where the young wasp has emerged as an adult and is now flying around and looking for another caterpillar of its own to lay its own eggs. These adult wasps are very small, and they may seem like gnats if you actually see them in your, around your plants and your landscapes, but you probably won't even notice them because they are so small. This points out that this is a great reason not to overuse insecticides. If you've used insecticides in your garden and you've killed back all of the caterpillars, these beneficial wasps, which are a natural way to treat this pest, get, also get treated and aren't as active. Our plant this week is butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa. It's a wonderful houseplant for larvae of the monarch butterfly, which plays right into what we've just talked about on insecticides for caterpillars. It has brilliant orange to bright red flowers and really deep, nice green foliage. Those flowers create a nice landing pad for butterflies, and adult monarchs sip the nectar from the flowers and then lay the eggs on this plant. So this is a plant that you'll have to sacrifice some to have monarchs in our landscape. You'll have to let those monarch larvae eat a little bit of those plants. It's an herbaceous perennial. It gets about two feet tall and up to about a foot and a half wide. It does look a little taller than bushy and wide. It does prefer full sun, tolerate a little bit of shade, and it will also tolerate clay soil, which makes it a good choice for us, although it does prefer better drainage. To do in your garden this month, you have a second chance to plant warm season vegetable favorites, such as tomato or eggplant. These plants don't normally produce as usually, don't usually produce as well in the heat as they might have for you in the spring, so you probably will not get as much fruit for them from them in the fall as you did in the spring. Those flowers that are formed are, the pollen in them is damaged by the heat and so there's not as much fertilization on those fruit and so you don't get as much fruit. We'd love to hear from you. Please visit klru.org ctg to send us your question or a plant of the week from your garden. Thanks Daphne. Now let's check in with Guy LeBlanc for Backyard Basics. Welcome to Backyard Basics. I'm Guy LeBlanc. We thank Philip Smith for sending in his question about a problem on his red oak. This is a great question since it's a fairly common problem in our area. Perhaps the two nutrients we have the most efficiency problems with in Central Texas are iron and nitrogen. Iron is a micronutrient, which simply ne means that a plant needs less of it than it does other essential nutrients. However, iron is the central ion in the chlorophyll molecule and as such is critical to plant health. A deficiency of iron is typically called iron chlorosis. This presents with a yellow leaf with green veins. The newest leaves are normally the first affected. As the deficiency progresses, browning and twig dieback can occur. This is very common in red oaks and there are several possible causes. Usually iron is sufficient in the soil, but the high pH of the soil makes it difficult for the plant to absorb the iron. Sometimes the problem is not the soil, but the tree itself. This can be the case with a hybrid in which one of the species in the hybrid is not able to uh, adapt to our alkaline soils. Also, if the plant is not locally grown, it may be grown in an acidic soil and again may not be able to adapt to the alkaline soils. Severe girdling roots can also mimic iron deficiencies. Also, symptoms can be caused by manganese deficiency, but this is rare in central Texas. Treating iron chlorosis can be very difficult. Soil pH cannot be permanently changed without replacing the soil. For a homeowner, typically we'll try to acidify the soil. This can be done with sulfur or mild acids such as citric acid. Professionals will sometimes use a stronger acid such as sulfuric acid. We can also try to treat this with chelated irons. The type that's typically best for this is one that will hold its chelation in an alkaline soil. This is referred to as EDDHA. You can also make foliar applications of iron, and this can be successful with smaller trees. You should follow your label directions for the amount to use. Now, when fertilizing any tree, it's very important to remember that nutrient balance is critical. Too much of one nutrient can cause a deficiency in others. 
For this reason, I recommend doing a soil analysis before fertilizing. Nitrogen is probably the most common deficiency in our central Texas soils. Nitrogen is a macronutrient and a major component of chlorophyll. Symptoms of nitrogen deficiency include yellowing of the entire leaf. Usually the older leaves will yellow first. Fortunately, treatment of nitrogen deficiency is fairly easy. I recommend three to four pounds of actual nitrogen per square feet, excuse me, per thousand square feet of soil. This includes the nitrogen already present in the soil, so again, you should do a soil analysis first. I recommend using slow-release forms of, of nitrogen, such as sulfur-coated urea or blood meal. Fast-release forms, such as ammonium sulfate, can cause problems with plant health by increasing insect or disease problems and can also pollute the aquifer. For Backyard Basics, I'm Guy LeBlanc. Visit klru.org slash ctg to watch online, get more tips, and visit our blog. Until next time, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online, and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Thank you.